So you guys know the drill. I'll ask a few questions, but we're going to have a microphone right there. So it is the first panel of the day. Please don't be shy. Come ask some questions in a bit. But ladies, first of all, how have you been enjoying Comic-Con Northern Ireland? Well, people have been very um, nice and pleasant. It's the second time that I've been in Northern Ireland, but my sister used to live here. So she lived in Belfast. Um, she went to university at Queen's um, back at the end of the 90s. So, yeah. So, but uh, people have been very welcoming. It's been lovely. It's nice it's a bit cooler today than it was yesterday. It's a bit warm. It was so warm yesterday, yes. But I'll, speaking of warm, we've had a very warm uh, welcome from everyone here in Belfast. You guys have been great. What's the fan interaction been like? Well, how was it yesterday meeting all of your fans? Sorry, could you repeat that? How was it meeting all of your fans yesterday? How were the oh, fans lovely. here? Lovely, yes, yesterday? it's lovely. Um, and people had lots to say. They had different bits of the film that they really liked and asked us what it was like to film with Stanley and with Jack and things. It was, it was really good. People are very welcoming. Yeah. And you also do a lot of horror conventions as well, right? What is it like working in the horror genre? Because, I mean, we have a lot of different things represented here, different films and TV, but what's it like in the horror section of things? This is Tamer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And less tattoos. <laughs> yes. yes. And generally more clothing. Yes. 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 <laughs> but very little on, for, for a steel tan, very little steel that anyone wears here. <laughs> Well, one thing we've well, noticed here mm -hmm. <laughs> in Belfast is that we've seen a lot of amazing cosplay, a lot of great creations, and everyone's so very passionate about the cosplay. What's it like for fans to dress up as the both of you? Oh, we find that very freaky. <laughs> it's like meeting yourself coming back again, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Particularly if they're um, young children who right. may have been suborned by their parents to do yes. it. Yes. So, you know, mum and dad can't get into those dresses anymore. Make the kids do it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, guys, if you have any questions, please come to the microphone. We want to interact with you guys. But a few more questions for me. I would love to know, ladies, how the role came to you. How, how, was it an audition process? Like, how, how did it all come about? Uh, yeah, there was an um, open audition. So we had already done some TV work, and we had an agent. And there was a Stanley Kubrick held an open audition, and he was just looking for um, girl children. He wasn't looking for twins or anything, or sisters. And... Um, my dad said, uh, because I want to be a movie star, um, and my dad said, oh, well, you know, we'll go, but don't be disappointed, and at least you get to see how a movie is made, and maybe you can see some cameras, and you can look around the lot and things like that, because um, back then, movie theatres didn't have, you know, like, uh, experiences where you could go and see these things. Right. And, um, and we got there, and there were all these kids from, like, stage schools, not that there's anything wrong with going to a stage school, but their hair was really nicely done and their clothes were really pretty and, you know, they had matching socks. And it's not that we couldn't have done that, it's just we'd gone to London for the day, so by the end of the day, you know, we were a bit damp around the edges. <laughs> and so my mum was sitting in the car, like, trying to do what she could with our hair that usually looks like we've been pulled through a hedge backwards. And so, um, you know, we're in these Marks and Spencer's clothes, dresses. And all these other kids were really nicely dressed up. And, you know, Mum said, oh, well, off you go. Just go and enjoy yourself. I mean, you know, it's a day out. <laughs> and um, I think we happened to say hello together to um, Leon Vitale. And he said, OK, stay. And he said, I'm going to introduce you to Stanley Kubrick. And it's literally like that. Wow. And it was sort of over and done with in no time. So, yeah, I think Warner Brothers have the audition tape. Wow. But... I don't know what, somewhere in, in LA, I don't, other than that, I don't know anything about it. Can you imagine if we had it here and we go, oh, here it is, that would be amazing. <laughs> I wish, that would be awesome. No, I'd probably cringe if I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask, what is it like to now watch it back this many years later? What is it like to watch it and remember how it was to be in the film? Your voice sounds much higher when you hear it on a recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I have a speech impediment, which I hear all the time on the recording, and I'm not aware of it when I'm talking now. Uh -huh. But you can probably hear it. But I'm cool with it now, thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm owning my speech impediment. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, that's, that's what I find weird. Yeah. And when you watch it back, we remember different bits. Because you can't remember the whole movie. You just yeah. like, and then I watch it again and think, oh, I can remember that bit. Or I remember that day. Or the maze looks really realistic, even though it had to be painted green because it all went brown. <laughs> and stuff like that. You think, yeah, you know. Yes, yeah, it's, it's amazing how good they can make film mock-ups look, you know. So if you, want to, you know, if you want to fool anyone or have a really good wedding, hire a film crew. They can make anything look good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
Well, it's certainly a, a big part of Hollywood history, and there's been so many parodies of the both of you from, from Family Guy. Who watches Family Guy here? I'm yeah, good. I mean, it's, it's all over the place. Modern Family also did a little parody of, of The Shining as well. Angry Birds, Angry Birds did a, modern, did a parody, yeah. yeah. My, my, I've got two boys, uh -huh. and they must have been on there was some video game that they're watching, and suddenly they're two Angry Birds dressed in little blue dresses. And one of my boys, Mom, it's you, you're an angry bird. I said, no, I'm not an angry bird. And what are you talking about? <laughs> you know you've made it when you're an angry bird. So I think that's a big, that's a big deal. <laughs> well, what are you ladies fans of? Because we have so many film and TV actors that are here and so many different genres represented, whether it be Star Wars or Harry Potter. But what films and TV do you enjoy watching? I like horror. You like Borat? I like horror, yeah. I like Oh, Psycho. I thought you said Borat. Yeah, no, horror. Um, I like Psycho, I like Rear Window, I like Hitchcock. Um, I like the sort of psychological things. So um, I, I quite liked Blair Witch Project, but only because I liked the way it was filmed rather than the story, yeah. So horror, most movies are made with a steady cam or something like that, or dollies. So the audience, you get a very flat, you know, things don't move up and down. Whereas in Blair Witch, when they're running, the camera's jogging like that and it feels like you're running. <laughs> And I, I like that. People that came back in. Yeah, it's exciting. Who here was duped by the Blair Witch Project? Who here thought it was real? Yeah. And then it turns out, you know how I knew it wasn't real? Because one of the actresses in the film is in an American Diner commercial. And I thought, well, she's alive. She's at a diner. We've got a question right here in the front. How are you? Hi. Um, well, I'm just wondering, I mean, obviously you knew what you were making when you made the film, but did you watch it right away or did you have to wait till you were older? And what did you think about it sort of? Were you scared by it? Obviously, probably not being, you know, filming it. <laughs> um, no, we weren't allowed to watch it straight away, although I was convinced they would change the law to allow us to go to the premiere. I was just totally... And then when they didn't, I was just gutted. <laughs> and I was very young. And then I didn't watch it until I was at university and it was on TV. And one of my flatmates said, oh, I'm going to watch this movie, The Shining. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm in that. And he said, you are not. And I said, I am. And he said, I said, if you don't believe me, watch it and see my name roll at the credits. And he said, yeah, okay then. I said, oh, let me know then, because it's quite late at night. And I said, oh, let me know, I'm going to bed. And the following day, <laughs> I came downstairs and he said, you changed your name, didn't you? Yes, I would change my name to someone else's name to tell you that I was in a movie. I said, of course I didn't change my name. <laughs> and it, like, I hadn't even thought about it for those intervening years. I've been doing A-levels and my dad said, you know, Acting's really insecure, you should get yourself a job. Um, so I got A-levels, I went to university, and I got a job uh, straight after university. So I hadn't really even thought about it for a long time. And then because it was on TV, I thought, you know what, maybe I will watch it again. And the first time I watched it, I thought, oh, I hope it's not going to be too scary. So I watched it with the sound down, <laughs> and it's not scary. <laughs> and then it was literally like 10, 15 years later, um, I saw it with the sound turned up, and every time it got to a really scary bit, I like, closed my eyes. I closed my eyes. So like a, you know, like a child, I used to hide from the Daleks and things like that. So I just kept closing my eyes. And I was thinking, God, I hope they don't all die. Even though I knew what the outcome was. <laughs> and then at the very end, I was sort of willing Danny to, oh yeah, you've got to make it, you've got to make it, you've got to make it. <laughs> so it was, I was surprised that I could sort of forget what it was like to make it and still see it as just being a real movie that kind of surprised me and stuff and then over time the more i've watched it i thought oh i remember that bit and i remember plastic snow and i remember um the guys the dolly guys complaining about how sticky it was and it stuck to everything you can get rid of it um and so different memories have come back over time but the first time my friend watched it and didn't believe me and then the second time i did watch it with the sound down <laughs> Thank you. That's a very good tip, to watch with the sound down. Yeah. What's crazy about the film is that it's still terrifying all these years later. What do you think it, it is about the film that's endured for this long? I think it's the normality. So I think everyone can relate to staying in a hotel because everyone at some point does stay in a hotel. Even if you're you know, like five, you still stay in a hotel. And hotels always have those corridors because they've got all those rooms. So I think it's just the fact that it's quite normal. And I think psychological horror works on a relationship between what you do every day and then how that could, if you could one day you might turn left rather than right and what happens when you turn left rather than right. Let's say you always turn right and then one day something happens and you can't turn right, you turn left. And then where does that go? But I think that also works for uh, psychological fiction as well. So it sort of takes you onto it. It's just 
almost like between two planes, going from your real, your real life reality into a sort of dreamscape world, right. where you could, you, could, you could write your own answer, but someone also might be writing the answer for you. It may not be the answer you want. Right. Yeah. It, it's, it could happen I quite to like you. psychological, yeah. um, thr psychological uh, novels for that, for that reason. This is a great time to mention that these two ladies are on the same hotel floor as me. So <laughs> my sleep has been very disturbed. Just kidding. We have another She's question. She's super with the lift. She's very good with the lift. <laughs> <laughs> question right here. Hi there. Hi. Uh, I heard Stanley Kubrick was famous for taking dozens and dozens of retakes of the same scene until he was perfected it. And Jack Nicholson said it took over 50 shots to get one scene. Did he do that same with you? Yeah, I yep. think he found the scene where we're dead very, very stressful because he spent the whole week setting up. He would only have one go at that. He knew there would, because the dresses would be, we only had one set of dresses. So the dresses that have their own tour, those are the original dresses. And if you look very closely, you can see whether Kensington Gore, that's the fake blood, um, has marked the clothing. And at the time he was told, he was really cross that Milena couldn't get another pair of dresses, but she just couldn't get another pair of dresses. And so he knew he would only have one shot. And he spent ages laying it out before he put any blood on there. And he set the whole shot up. And we spent, it took almost a week to film. It was the shot, the last shot film for that movie. And he spent most of the week going, I'm gonna have this. And then he'd try it without the blood. So with us laying in different positions, he'd have a look and he'd try to imagine it with the blood. It took a long time for him to decide, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. But he was, he was a very, very sensitive, um, person and he was really really sweet about that because you know when you're 11 and someone says i'm going to cover you in fake blood and make you look like you're dead and <laughs> you know you can't kind of think hmm, maybe kids don't want to do that so he spent a long time with us and tom the makeup man and tom would paint different scratches on our face or our hands and they looked really realistic and then tom would go look it's just gone it's nothing it's just make-believe but the only thing i was really worried about was getting cold so <laughs> I don't really like to be cold. Um, and Stanley got heaters because the set was a place a bit like this, a sound studio, and they just looked like hangers. And so it was really, really cold. And he did close the set so no one else could come on and you could keep the door shut. But when the blood was put down, it was cold and clammy. And Tom had mixed it with, I think it was vegetable oil to make it viscous and run like blood does. Um, and so it's sticky. <laughs> And uh, Stanley said, oh, I'll get some heaters so you're not cold. But yeah, so I think that, he must have found that very stressful because I know he took loads of shots all the other times. And then this one time he's going, okay, look, I've only got one go. I'm going to have to spend more time planning it. He time did, yeah, it. yeah, he did, yeah. But it, it, it shows in the product, doesn't it? So yeah. if you take that many shots, you get really warm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. If anyone else wants to ask a question, we have time for maybe one more. There we go, this lovely gentleman here. Hi ladies, thanks for coming, Hello. good to see you. Um, when you were uh, filming, did you realise at such a young age that this would become such an uh, iconic movie, your characters would become so iconic and synonymous with the movie? No. Or how further on down the road was it before you realised that this movie was massive and your characters were massive? Uh, no, I, I didn't think it'd even make box office money. I thought it'd be a right flop. <laughs> I thought, who'd want to go and see that? <laughs> but um, I suppose the first time we realised it was going to be... Well, the first time we realised that the image of those two shining girls, those twins, was someone pointed it out on the billboard at Piccadilly Circus. And it was being used to advertise one of those odd mobile company things that are there, like a, like a pop-up company thing that you get them for six months and then they die somewhere. And they've got, I don't know, headquarters in India or something like that. Um, and my friend pointed out, and she said, oh, look, there's you. And I said, no, I don't think that is. I think, I think it's just an image. I think, you know, it's not... You can't really copyright an image of two people holding hands wearing a blue dress, I don't think. Though I think Warners are trying. <laughs> but, yeah, so, no, it, it, it never... I don't think it ever really occurred to any of us at the time. I think we thought Jack Nicholson would probably get a really good part out of it, and he went on to do so. But I don't think the rest of us thought it was, it was really... Yeah, um, I don't really think the rest of us thought, it, I never thought, I don't think anyone actually thought it would become so iconic. But at the time, the only thing that was iconic for Kubrick was because he'd pulled um, Clockwork Orange. So in the UK, he was most famous for being a person who pulled his own film, even though 
you want the film to show to make the money because that's the point of make, that's how he's going to get the next film made, isn't it? Yeah, so he was most known for that. People had dropped the Lolita thing by then. So he got over Lolita. So yeah, it was very controversial. In, but he did lots of controversial things. I didn't, I didn't necessarily think into the future that it would last like it has done, but I, I hoped it would. And when I watch old movies, I imagine that's how the people who made those old movies must have thought. Because it's like having something that lives forever. So, you know, um, after I left university, I was a genetic engineer. So to me, this is like DNA that just goes on and on and on forever. So that would be lovely to think that, you know, as we look back and we, people still play Buster Keaton movies, and you think, you know, that's the last century, that's you know, almost 100 years ago. And I think, yeah, if people could look at horror and it'd be 100 years' time, that, that's amazing, that's like a statue. So I think it's, it's really, we're really, really lucky that people still want to see it and still enjoy it. And we'll still come to events like that to see a couple of old women. It's very, very lovely. We'd like to thank all of you for coming. It really means an enormous amount. Um, a pair of twins came up to us yesterday and they said, yeah. oh, we came, we're not really horror fans, but we came because we're twins. And I thought, oh, wow. Oh, yeah, it's really nice. It's, in some ways, it's really nice to meet other twins if you have, if you're a twin. Yeah, because the, there's a whole thing psychology thing. Told us their life story. It's really great. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. Thank for your you. Thanks very much for asking. Well, the film will last forever, and you know what else will last forever? The nightmares. So thank you for that, ladies. In all seriousness, what are you ladies looking forward to after Comic Con Northern Ireland, either professionally or personally? What's next for you after you leave here? Well, for me, my oldest son is going to university in two weeks' time. So I've got two weeks to get, um, he needs plates and cutlery. I never knew you needed these things. He needs plates, cutlery and sheets. And he's 18, he's like, yeah, we could do it tomorrow. I'm just going to play this game all tomorrow. And I'm going, you know what, we're running out of tomorrows. And I have to rush around and get all this stuff. So that's my next two weeks are going to be spent in supermarkets and department stores buying <laughs> things. And he goes, oh, I don't need to take too much, Mum. I'm going, well, you will need to because you have to get up every day, feed yourself, get to university, get dressed, come home, get washed, blah, blah. So I said, you are going to need stuff. No one else is going to do this for you. It's not going to be me any longer. You're going to have to get yourself organised. I know. I don't think he realises. I said, get a Tesco's card because you can get pizza half price. <laughs> every 18-year-old boy would love that for sure. What are you looking forward to after Belfast? Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing my cat. <laughs> She's very fluffy and she hasn't been eating because it's so hot. She's got quite a lot of fur. She's practically a sheep. <laughs> um, yeah, I've got plans for her afterwards as well. <laughs> She's got two little holes at either end <laughs> and I'd like a muff. <laughs> no, I wouldn't actually do that to my cat. I think it might be illegal. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm looking forward to seeing her and then I'm hoping to come back in a couple of weeks time and hook up with a friend I hooked up with last night oh, yeah. and see how much more vibrant is, how much more vibrant Belfast is yeah. now I was here in the, just uh, the late 80s. Yeah, I, I don't know how many people remember the late 80s. You all look far too young, actually. <laughs> and I'm not I sure if the guys at the end are genuine policemen. I can't recognise them anymore. But, um, yeah, so Belfast has changed so much. It's like coming to a different world. So I left. Um, the last time I was here was about three days before they signed the Good Friday Agreement. So everything was still in place. And I never realised how big the roads are. Donegal Pass. I never realised it was worth two cars. Because they used to have this enormous police station at one end, and then they put these red and white blocks down the side to make the road, so you could only get one car down, so they only stopped one car. And one thing I don't think I'm ever going to miss is someone popping my boot and deciding they're going to dismantle the car, and they're not a car mechanic. So they don't mind, but you've got no guarantee the British Army are going to put the car back together the way you had it. <laughs> and that used to worry me like hell. <laughs> Sometimes they weren't my car. <laughs> Obviously, I wasn't taking them. <laughs> they were lent. <laughs> Yeah, so one thing I, I don't think I'm ever going to miss is missing a flight because someone decides to ask my name. <laughs> anyway. Well, we're so happy to have you guys here. You've been so lovely, and I hopefully you'll have a great day for the rest of uh, Comic-Con Northern Ireland. These ladies are going to be in the autograph area, so please come say hello, get an autograph, grab a selfie. Any final thoughts for your fans here in Belfast? Yes, we're not frightening in real life. <laughs> Although, I don't know who's more frightened now, the audience or me. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming and asking us questions. Yes, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. please keep showing a warm Belfast welcome to Lisa and Louise Burns. Thank you so much, ladies. There's so much more fun happening here on the main stage.